Hi, I'm Ibi, and you're listening to Kill the Cat. In this episode, we're looking at The Good Place, and how focusing on your characters, tone, and theme can help provide a perfect ending for your audience. We'll be discussing some major twists and plot points for the show from as early as Season 1, so if you haven't seen it yet, this is your warning. But now, on with the episode. Hello and welcome to Kill the Cat. We are coming to you from another lockdown here in Sydney, Australia, which has been lots of fun. Uh, But today we are talking about The Good Place. One of the things that stuck out, I think, to both of us when we watched the show was the fact that it kind of ends really, really well. And uh, we kind of wanted to unpack how does it end well? Like, what are some of the techniques being used in storytelling, in themes, in characters to make that happen? Yeah, so I think it's really hard to end a show well. And I think it's much harder to do than, say, a movie or even a trilogy. Mm. There are actually very few examples of TV shows that have the perfect ending. But I also think that's becoming a lot more common since we've started streaming We don't have this idea anymore of the week-by-week procedural that both has to appeal to recurring viewers and to grab viewers who are just channel surfing. That's how I used to find my shows. Do you remember doing this? You'd just be like surfing the channels and you'd be like, oh, that looks interesting. And you'd start watching it maybe mid-season and then you'd get into it. Mm. Or if you had something on the night when that show was on, you just missed an episode, but that was okay because you came back the following week and not enough had happened that you couldn't just immediately figure it out. Um, I feel like streaming has, yeah, as you said, like really sort of transformed the way we consume media because we tend to binge it a lot more. And so that means that you can do a lot more with character arcs and um, like development of the story because people are going to be there for it. You're not dealing with the crowd who's coming in halfway through. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about this on our Shit's Creek episode about how the sitcom is changing. The Good Place is a sitcom. Mm. It's a modern sitcom. I had a few examples of other shows I think have perfect endings, which include uh, Parks and Recreation, Bojack Horseman, Shit's Creek and Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. And then we also had some shows that uh, famously don't end so well. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Game of Thrones. <clears throat> I, I, I actually think there's a lot of shows that, yeah, you could put under that category. And, you know, there's different reasons for that. I think a big one is, you know, just shows going too long and hitting a point where there's just no way to satisfyingly end it. I think How I Met Your Mother is a really good example of that. By the time we got to season 10, the ending, which I won't ruin for you, is kind of a bit of a letdown. But I don't know that there was another option that wouldn't have been a letdown. Uh, Game of Thrones, you know, they cut it short because they were kind of done with creating the show. And it's like, actually, we needed another three seasons to wrap that up well. Yeah. And another one was Lost, where because they didn't really know where that was going, Um, J.J. Abrams just kept throwing out mystery box after mystery box Mm. and there was never ever going to be a way to satisfactorily wrap all of that up and then we have shows that never got to end at all like I think the most famous one is Firefly another one would be Sense8 where they just get cancelled and we never got an ending Yeah, but we did get an ending for The Good Place and we got the perfect ending so today we are going to talk about how to perfectly end a show Mm. So one of the first points I put out and we sort of touched on it, but it's this idea of like knowing when to finish up. The Good Place is really good in its seasonal structure in how they pace out the story arcs and the beats. Season one, it's kind of focused on them contemplating the fact that maybe they're not good people, about them coming to awareness of who they are and why they are where they are. Um, And it's them discovering their flaws and kind of trying to find a way out. Season two is about them realizing that actually they could become better people again, even on Earth. Um, And so it wasn't just because of the good place, but actually it was also because of them meeting with each other and having the support they needed to be good people. Season three was really cool in that we got to see them facing the roots of a lot of their flaws, which for three of the main characters that involved interacting with their parents, Tahani had to reconcile with her sister about the fact that their parents were just kind of jerks to them. Eleanor had to reconcile with her mum and Jason, you know, reconnect with his dad uh, although in the end... Donkey Doug. Donkey Doug. <laughs> uh, 
I love at the end when Donkey Dog is giving a speech for Jason's goodbye and he's like, but in a way, you were like my dad, son. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. Um, and then season four is all about them taking what they've learned and uh, like learning how to teach that to others. It's done in a way that's so tight that it's kind of hard to really take any more seasons from that like I don't know where you could go beyond where they already went and because they kept it tight because they kept it contained and because they just let the characters deal with what they needed to deal with and then moved on to the next thing they were able to wrap the show up really nicely yeah so one of the things I noticed on doing like a full show rewatch for this episode is they had events and occurrences that were done in a few episodes that could have been its own season so I think the most famous one there is the beginning of season two, uh, where Michael is rebooting the humans again and again and again. And I feel like for a lot of shows, like that would have been the setup for season two. It's that they're trapped in the bad place and they have to figure out how to get out, even though their memories keep getting erased. They literally have a montage of all the different bad place scenarios Michael puts them in. Jason figured like, it they, out? Oh, yeah. this is a low point. <laughs> this one doesn't even count, snaps fingers. <laughs> But, like, each of those little things in the montage could have been their own episode. And I think that would have been really boring because the humans would have kept forgetting. Mm. So they're not growing or developing in any way. But they just montage that. And then they're like, okay, we're not doing that. That's done. We're going to do the next thing, which is they're going to team up with Michael. And even, like, this episodes that feel like they could have been season finales, but they happen, like, two-thirds of the way through. So going back to season two, they leave the neighborhood. The neighborhood gets deleted and they go try to get out through the bad place. Mm. And that moment where the neighborhood folds up and they say it's goodbye feels like the end of the season, but they keep going. They get to the bad place, they get to the judge, and then it still doesn't end because their last episode is a year of Eleanor's life back on Earth, which feels like the beginning of season three, but it's not. It's the season two finale. Yeah, they do that a couple of times where they'll take sort of the last episode of a season you could almost make it the first episode of the next season, which is really good at building anticipation for the next season, uh, getting us excited and setting up a lot of the stuff that will happen in the next season. Yeah. So like the ending of season three is Eleanor becoming the architect of the new neighborhood, which again feels like the first episode of season four, but because they put it at the end of the season instead, we just know exactly where we're going to come back to mm. when the show starts up again. And it never feels like, okay, we needed a new idea for the new season. I'm going to grab Supernatural as an example. It's a show that went way, way too long. Supernatural feels like it naturally ends around about season five, where the apocalypse they've been building up to happens. But because they keep going, they just have like a more and more ridiculous villain each season and a good place just feels like one cohesive really well paced narrative from episode one to the finale there's even things they could have extended out to a whole season that on a, another watch you're like oh yeah that was only like four episodes um things yeah, like, like the soul squad yeah the soul squad is only a couple episodes the test with the new four people with Brett and Simone and Chidi and I can't remember the last one's name. Uh, John. And John. Um, like that could have been a whole season, but it wasn't. It was like, I think it was five episodes. And then they just move on to the next thing. Like they cut out six months from that story uh, that we just don't see. And it's, it's almost like what we talked about in The Princess Bride of like this, just skip the boring bits, like just keep what you need to keep in. Yeah, it keeps changing. And I think, cause this was actually a show that came out week by week and I was so excited for every episode and would go back and watch an episode multiple times waiting for the new one. Mm. Cause you just knew you were gonna get so much and it was never gonna be a repeat. The pacing's generally fast. There are a couple of exceptions to that. There's the one in season two where they think they've lost because it's revealed Michael doesn't know how to get to the good place. Yep. And then they just kind of hang out for an episode. And that's like a nice break before we get back into the action. But in general, it does feel like there is a destination. Even though they weren't 100% sure when they started the show where it was going to end. Um, they just, it feels so confident in its tone and what it wants to say. And I think that brings us into our next point, which is choosing the question you want your show to ask. 
Yeah, I think this show kind of wears its questions pretty openly, but you know, it's addressing a number of questions about like the nature of humanity and the afterlife and morality. I think the recurring question is probably the one that I lean to as a way to frame the show. And that's the, what do we owe to each other question? I think every question they ask, they kind of frame it in that way at some point, you know, when they look at, you know, what is the nature of the afterlife? Uh, when Chidi and Simone are discussing whether it's all just a thing of her neurons firing or if it's real, you know, he basically kind of makes the case of like, hey, we should still be kind to each other regardless. Yeah, like just in case this is real. Yeah. How about you be nice to people just in case yeah. it's not all in your head? Mm. I really love that they bring in, well, they brought in the author of the book in the last episode, but they also use that, like some of the last passages of that book as Eleanor's sort of moment of understanding that she needs to let Chidi go because that's what she owes to him. Uh, and it's this really beautiful kind of ongoing question that they bring throughout the show. But yeah, the show is really good at asking some really deep questions and giving answers to some and not giving answers to others. Yeah, because it does kind of ask the question, what happens after we die? But at the end, the answer to that is basically, it doesn't really matter what happens to you after you die. It matters what happens to the world after you die and have you left it a better place than when you entered it. Mm. I don't know. It's always like it's sentimental. That's that was your word for it when we were talking about before we started the episode. Uh, manages to be like lighthearted and sentimental. It also goes into like deep philosophical discussions. Mm. Like literally, there are philosophy lectures in the show, and it never feels boring. Yeah, I think one of the things as well it does really it is it makes all of these sort of deeper questions accessible. Like they seem really focused on never trying to go above people's heads or be too complex for people to understand. Like they keep things really simple. You know, they kind of have to with Jason there. But I think that makes it like, it means that it's a show that people can engage with that is talking to questions that we often don't get to engage with in these kinds of shows. And they know their philosophy. Like Mike Scher did so much research and you can tell. And they don't pick a philosophy that they want to like preach at you. They're exploring different options. Like we get into like determinism and moral particularism, uh, nihilism (laughs) when Chidi makes the chili. (laughs) That is like my favorite scene in the whole show, I think. Um, Surprisingly ripped, shirtless Chidi. Yep. (laughs) So choosing a question you want to put out there You don't have to know the answer. That's totally fine. As long as you know what your question is. Um, This is actually where I'm pretty sure Game of Thrones messed up. Like the creators of that show have gone on record saying we didn't think about theme, Mm. which bugs me a lot. Themes are there in Game of Thrones. Um, We talked about this in our Middle Ditch and Schwartz episodes. Like you do naturally incorporate those things. But if you want a really good ending, like know what you're trying to say and how your ending is going to contribute to that. Uh, mm. Mike Sher is really good at this, and all his shows are essentially about being good humans to each other. That's The Office and Parks and Rec and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Yeah. Well, Brooklyn Nine-Nine doesn't have an ending yet, but we assume it'll be good. We Yeah. And I think just what's going on with police in the States at the moment, I think giving it one more season to wrap it up and then ending it is the classy move. Yeah, I think so. So all of that said, theme very naturally leads into character which this show does well as well. So why don't we talk a little bit about character design? Yes, we've got six main characters and we've got four main human characters. So Michael in the show, his idea is to get four humans perfectly designed to torture each other and keep them in the same neighborhood for eternity to make each other miserable. But that's not what happens. The four characters he brings together improve each other, and this is because each of the characters represent an aspect that we need to be a good person. So Chidi is the conscience, so he's a moral philosophy professor. Everybody hates moral philosophy professors. (laughs) So he has the knowledge. Tahani is kindness on a community scale with all of her fundraising. Jason is kindness on a personal scale, where he's like genuinely very nice to all the people in his life. But none of that matters if you don't have the last element, which is Eleanor, which is the will to take all of that and use it to become a better person. Mm. All those characters um, get really complete arcs. Like Jason, he starts off, uh, he starts off as Jianyu. We think he's just a monk. 
And, you know, one of the great moments of the last episode is that he comes back having spent a thousand years just kind of thinking. But yeah, he goes on this journey of being kind of a bit dim-witted, but, you know, obviously being one of the kindest people one-on-one. And by the end of the show, he's actually having some really good ideas, which is very nice. He's also the first character to go. And I think that's important and a good choice because he's kind of the most relatable one. And to see him go first, A, just makes sense for him. Like, I think he would be the one who could be most satisfied most easily. But it also makes the, you know, final door to walk through a lot more, like a lot safer. Yeah. So Mike Scher and Drew Goddard said they chose Jason to go first. They called him like a funny weapon for the last episode, just because the last episode, and we'll get into an analysis of the finale in a bit. But yeah, they said Jason going through the door at the end first and just not being scared of it at all. And we actually get to see him do it kind of twice. Mm. He goes the first time and then he does the thousand years, becomes a monk, gives Janet her necklace. And then his last word said, Chidi, wait up, and just runs through the door after Chidi. Mm. Just no hesitation. His first words were, I've been waiting for you, to Eleanor. Ooh, yeah, and then it's Chidi, fun. wait up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fun. That's very fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, in other people, Tahani goes from being this sort of self-obsessed, kind of selfish personality to she becomes an architect in the end, which is like the ultimate expression of her being able to do things for other people. Um, Yeah, because she starts off as doing things for others, but it's secretly for herself. And then she ends up completely in service to other people. And she also wanted skills. So she went off and like learned all the skills she wanted to. And that still wasn't enough. She learned a new one and became an architect. And she and she like did that fully of her own merit. She went through the process, started at the bottom, as she said, and worked her way up. Uh, Even uh, I mean, there's more of the main characters like Michael, um, you know, being able to become human at the end, which is just this great arc for him because he goes on this whole journey of like trying to change the system. Even when he's a bad place architect, he wants to change the system and the way things are done and push the envelope. And he gets to a point where he realizes actually he has to hand that over to Vicky because he's not the person to keep carrying it. And he's a bit lost for a while and then eventually gets to go back to Earth and live out as a human for a while before he will eventually go into the afterlife and He doesn't know if the system's going to be the same when he does, but he acknowledges that as like being part of the fun of being human. Yeah, that's kind of where the show ends up. And like, we can't tell you what happens when you die. That's part of the beauty of being a human. Mm. It's not knowing. And even when Michael goes back, Eleanor says, like, I can't promise we're going to have the system by the time you die. Sean could stage a coup. Anything could happen. He's like, yeah, that's part of being human. Yeah. Um, Which leaves us with... Quick one on Janet. Janet, I think, was really clever in that they said at the end she experiences all time all at once. Mm. So she doesn't really have to say goodbye. Otherwise, you kind of get the sense that these people are going to leave and leave Janet there forever. So I think that was a clever way to, like, give Janet a happy ending. Mm. And that leaves us with Chidi and Eleanor. Obviously, they found happiness with each other. But I really appreciated that the end goal for them wasn't we are together now and therefore we are happy, which is an ending we've seen done so many times. And we're beginning to steer away from that. Like Schitt's Creek was an example of that Mm. um, with Alexis and Ted. Um, And I also like how their final like completed moment for both of their arcs happen at the same time, which is Chidi decides he's ready to go and Eleanor selflessly lets him. Yeah, and, like, you know, it would have been easy to have the entire group go out together. Like, you know, they all came into the good place together and they all decide, oh, we're ready, and they move on, walk through the door together. But I think that doesn't hold true to, like, the individual journeys that each of these characters have gone through. And so I think giving each character their moment was really important to making it a satisfying end for the characters. I also love that you get, like, ends for the side characters. Sean, you know, in the second last episode has his reveal about how he just didn't want the rivalry with Michael to end because he was finally having fun in what he did again. Vicky getting to step up and be sort of the perfect choice to lead the new system in terms of the architects, uh, I thought was a really nice touch. You know, the judge getting to go back to her (laughs) shows and being like, oh, you guys will all be gone and you won't be here to annoy me anymore. A frog man getting a real frog. He gets a real frog. (laughs) (laughs) There's um, 
there's the bloopers uh, for season four and there's like a whole bunch of clips of him just like ad-libbing stuff with the frogs. It's very funny. Um, and even Bad Janet, like joining the cause and all the Janets coming together a few episodes before the last one. They've got a couple of little details in the finale, which is um, Trevor is still flying through the void forever. <laughs> And Brett is still attempting to get through the system. Oh, man. Rewatching it, I was like, man, Brett is painful. This is. He's an entitled boomer. Like, yeah. of course, that's who they put in the experiment to annoy Eleanor. And then we got, um, we got our last character who completes their arc, which is Mindy St. Clair. Yeah. And this one is kind of tied to Eleanor's arc. I, I kind of had it as like Eleanor as the best version of herself goes to Mindy, who is like the worst version of what she could have been to try and convince her to go through the system. Yeah. And Mindy is like, thank you for caring enough about me to like convince me to do this. There's literally no stone left unturned. They get to all the characters. Mm. And I also like the take that they don't end up in the good place forever. That's not the ending. Yeah, because they become happiness zombies. I had a little note that early on they say all of... The characters and I was friends. Just about to yeah. say that. <laughs> Except for Phoebe. <laughs> Except for Phoebe. Phoebe goes to the good place and then when they get to the good place, it's Lisa Kudrow. And I'm like, was that on purpose? I think so, because it's only like three or four episodes before the finale. So surely by that point yeah. they would have known. It was such a great yeah. little detail. Like this is a show essentially about death and the meaning of life. They said basically, um, the takeaway is humans are a little bit sad all the time. Because we know one day we're going to die. And that's kind of the point of being human. And morality and ethics don't matter if you're going to live forever. They have like a whole thing with Michael. Uh, Michael cannot grasp Chidi's ethics lessons because he's immortal. And mm. only when they're like, contemplate like your own death and they give him an existential <laughs> crisis, which is a wonderful episode. Um, so I think having the door at the end and saying, at one point, you will feel complete and you'll be ready to give your essence back to the universe. Mm. Going back to the idea of like asking a question that answers the question by almost not answering it because they don't know what's going to happen when they go through the door. Mm. In an early draft, they actually had Chidi like explaining um, when you go through the door, your essence will go back to earth and like the goodness in you will be passed on to other people. But they ended up cutting that out. Cause they're like, no, the beauty is not knowing. And I mean, they still show that, but it's, it's much more subtle, right? In just yeah. showing Eleanor's essence kind of go into that last good deed so that um last little scene where she comes down and then someone does something nice to michael that was inspired by mike Sher getting a wrong letter in his mail and then having the impulse to be like i'll oh, just throw it out and then being like no it's only one street over i'll go and deliver it to the person and he did and then he's like and on the way i ran into someone with a puppy and because i delivered this letter that i didn't really want to deliver i got to play with a puppy <laughs> and my day got a little bit better. And that's what inspired the final scene. Aww, that's I it. know, it's so nice. Do we want to talk a little bit about tone? Yeah. So the tone of the show is very silly in so many places, despite the fact that it's dealing with these really like deep existential questions. I had in my notes, there's no unnecessary drama. So for example, there's no character deaths in like a meaningful way. Like these characters die. That's kind of the point of the yep. show. They die But they are always times. around. They die many, many times. But none of them are ever written off the show. Mm. We start with these six characters. We end with these six characters. And even when they're bringing in new characters, like um, the new humans for Eleanor's experiment, they don't become the main cast. Like, say, the last season of Community, yeah. for example. Or yeah. Glee tried this as well and it didn't work. Mm. Um, we get to stay with these six characters. Like, there is some love triangle stuff going on, but it's never, like, the central focus. Yeah, they don't give it heaps of time. Like, they let it be what it needs to be. Um, like, it's a real motivation for Janet to kind of learn how to experience emotions as she's sort of evolving into her final version. But yeah, they don't like make a whole thing out of it. Yeah, they don't have Eleanor and Chidi breaking up because they're out of drama. It's not like we need Ross and Rachel to break up because we're running out of ideas and now let's have Rachel date Joey for a bit. Mm. Um, like they break up because Simone comes in and Chidi's like, I can't do this experiment. You have to wipe my memories and therefore I'm going to break up with Eleanor. Like, it's part of the theme and part of the arc. It's not just to create drama. Yeah. For me, like, Good Place is so sentimental as well. It's, like, lighthearted and sentimental. They're really good at, like, 
bringing that sentimentality into the ending as well. Mm. Uh, I think there's some shows that, like, you could get your character notes, right? But if your ending has to be so tonally different from the rest of the show, uh, I think you're going to miss the mark with the ending as well. Um, But in this show, it's kind of like they gave it the full hour so that they could just explore it in the way that the good place would explore the ending. Uh, Yeah, and part of the reason they made that final episode an hour was to represent how long all the characters got to spend in the good place Mm. because they're there for um, the measurement of time in the after place is a jeremy (laughs) Jeremy. so that's what they calculated and and we have no idea how long that is in like human years but we assume they're there for like a really really long time before they walk through the door Mm. and giving us an hour long finale was a part of that to represent that I think in terms of tone for that last episode, like they really hit the sentimentality with like Chidi visiting the places throughout Europe with Eleanor and like all the really intimate goodbyes, like uh, Eleanor and Chidi just looking out over the sunset and watching that as they talk about the wave metaphor. Yeah. uh, (laughs) Even Tahani, like hosting her last party before she decides to become an architect is like such a Tahani thing to do, like just a party just for her friends. She said goodbye to her parents, said goodbye to her sister, watching Eleanor and Janet um, say goodbye. And, you know, Eleanor got both Janet and Tahani to problematically objectify her at some point throughout the episode. (laughs) Yep, very important. They put (laughs) Tahani back in the same dress that she was wearing in the pilot. Oh, yeah. Back in that yellow dress. I missed that. Yeah, yeah. I love Tahani's wardrobe so much. I just want everything she's wearing. (laughs) Even just that last note, as we talked about, of Eleanor's essence, like slipping in to inspire the good deed from the guy who lives near Michael. But then it also keeps like the lightheartedness of the good place with, you know, Jason's surprise reveal that he had been out there for like a thousand years waiting for the real Janet to show up. Like there's all these little moments of just lightness that allow the goodbye to be sort of bittersweet, right? Like it's sad to see them go, but probably the best way for them to go. Yeah, and I think if you were going to sum up what a perfect finale is in one word, I think bittersweet is the right word for it. Christian Bell even said, the show ended too soon, but that's what you get. It's a lot like life. Yeah, we would have loved a couple more seasons of The Good Place to hang out with these characters, but we don't get that. Just like um, we don't get all the time we want on Earth. And there's a line in there which is like, That's what The Good Place is. It's just enough time with the people you love. Mm. And yeah, we essentially watch these characters die. We watch them end and we watch them be satisfied with that ending. But yeah, I think a good ending doesn't have to be depressing and it doesn't have to be super happy. It kind of has to be somewhere in between for the audience and for the characters. Mm. Even if you look at Schitt's Creek, um, all four of those characters get happy endings, but they don't stay together as a family. They have to go their own way. Alexis has to say goodbye to Ted. It's bittersweet. And we're going to miss those characters. Yeah. So I said at the beginning, ending a TV show well is different to ending a movie well. With Mm. a movie, you have, because you have less time, but also because of the structure of movies, you kind of have to have your big finale and your character change. And then maybe we get one or two more scenes that wrap it up. That is the end of the movie. With a TV show, so Parks and Rec does this as well, is by the time you get to this finale, all the external conflicts are done. The system's been changed. All the bad guys now are essentially on the good guy's side and they're working together. The good place has been fixed. So because of that, there's just the internal conflicts left. And that's really nice because we get an entire hour. We just get to spend wrapping up these characters without some literally universe ending event getting in the way of that. I appreciate that as well. Like when they got into the good place, obviously there was that, you know, it was problems. But I appreciate that they just, they let that be like a one like even kind of half an episode of like dealing with that problem. And then it was out. They didn't spend the whole episode worrying about that because largely like the characters had undergone their arcs by that point, even by sort of season, like end of season three, they'd really kind of healed of a lot of the stuff that was for them, their sort of major flaws. And so there's no point in trying to pad out dealing with the good place because in terms of the internal arcs, they're kind of done. 
And so there are going to be a few last conflicts, like just of like, when are we done and ready to say goodbye? And how do we let the other people go? Like things like yeah, that. Yeah, like Chidi is ready to go before Eleanor. And how do you cope with that mm. in that scenario? And then Eleanor, once Chidi is gone, she's like, I'm ready. I'm not ready. I fixed Mindy. Okay, that's not it. Oh, okay, I've helped Michael. Now I'm ready. Mm. Should we perfectly end our episode? Uh, we can definitely try. Let's talk about what we learned. All right. I think for me, there's just a couple of things. Um, and there were things that kind of came out of listening to interviews with like Mike Schur and other creatives involved on the show. One of the points that he made actually uh, when he was talking about the ending for Parks and Rec was this idea of like focusing on the last words that a character is going to say. And I would add as an extension, even their last moments and work back from there. The last words are kind of the thing that you get left with for that character. And so that's going to frame the way that they're remembered. And so it's really important that you kind of think about how do you want to remember this character? And then you can work back from there as a way of writing their ending. So for Jason, uh, he spends his last moments as a monk, which is like just this really great circular sort of rounded ending for him. And so if you had started there, how do you make that happen? Well, okay. He waits for Janet. He is going to give something to her. And so you have to have him have that thing and you have to have him lose that thing. So working backwards can just inspire some ideas if you're getting stuck on how to end a character. Michael's last moments are of him doing really silly human stuff like getting a membership card. Uh, I loved on the membership card, his last name is Real Man. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, very Michael. It was very Michael. But he burns himself on a microwave dinner. He learns the guitar. And then he gets to impart sort of his like final words of, uh, you know, wisdom with all the love in his heart and all the wisdom in the universe. Take it sleazy. It's thinking about how do you want to end this character and then working back from there, I think is a really great way to figure out what they need in that final moment. I think the other one, and I say this a lot, but just like let the story be what it needs to be. Don't try to push your story out for the sake of pushing it out. And that comes back to sort of the like pacing stuff and the like, they probably could have kept this show going for another few seasons, but it didn't need it. And so rather than trying to extend it and stretch it, they just let it go how it needed to go and then end it when it was right to end. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of that as we move forward in terms of how sitcoms are changing I think Mike Schur has been a really big influence in how sitcoms have changed in the last few years. But yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more stories that are just telling the story they need to tell and then they'll end and that'll be okay. We'll get to talk about those endings and those stories as a whole rather than just remembering certain episodes or moments like we did with older sitcoms like Seinfeld or Friends. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Just the simple thing of like, know where you want your protagonist to end up. Uh, I think a lot of people start with like, I have a really cool concept for this character and then this and this and this and this. Um, but it can be something as simple as, I have a selfish Arizona trash bag, <laughs> quoting the show. <laughs> um, by the way, slight side note, it is really nice to see like this character which has been done a lot, but female. Yeah. I feel like we get kind of like the asshole with like a heart of gold trope, like, you know, Tony Stark, etc. We hardly ever, ever, ever see it with women. And that was really cool. But yeah, as simple as this Arizona trash bag who is selfish and self-serving, but because she's never had any meaningful human connection, it's going to become so selfless that she's going to save the entire universe because of the connection she makes with other people. That's the show. You don't need to know all the plot points. Uh, you don't need to know where exactly everything is going to line up. But if you just have that, that is a really good place to start. I think my biggest takeaway here was that idea of this could be an entire season or this could go on for longer. But maybe if we fast forward through that or just hit the important beats, Princess Bride style, we might end up somewhere a lot more interesting. Even to the point of things that feel like season finales, being two thirds of the way through the season because you can get more interesting stuff. Yeah. So that was my biggest takeaway out of the show. And this is the end of our episode on The Good Place and how to create the perfect ending. If you found this episode helpful, you can help us grow our show by leaving a review or subscribing on your platform of choice. This helps other listeners find us and keeps you updated for future episodes. 
Coming up soon, we have episodes on The Matrix, Pirates of the Caribbean, and Atlantis. Until next time, take it sleazy. Look, according to um, the old good place, bad place rules, we're both artists, so we're going to the bad place anyway. Um, oh, yeah. All artists go to the bad place.